the PTF file into Altera Monitor. You need to import the SOF file into Altera Monitor. And you need to specify build a C program, what's it called, using drivers. Specify C using drivers. If you just specify C without using drivers, then it does not load up any of the of the HAL driver system and you are reduced to using peek and poke. Which you can do. And then you have to use absolute address absolute address values which work but are inconvenient, undocumented, and every time you run SOPC Builder they may change. Any questions about this at this point? Or oh, it says so. It says C or program using drivers or something, but you want to use the using drivers. Darwin. Yeah. If lab space user is not is not a is not a valid path, but you can write directly to C colon slash slash because you are administrative you have administrative access to these machines. So you can put you can write anywhere you want on the disk. And when you log off, it will be wiped. So you don't even have to remove it. But you're quite right. Any path, any path with a space in it anywhere will cause the Altera monitor or the NIOS IDE to fail obscurely. Any other gotchas you found, Luke or Darwin? The Altera monitor came up for me very easily. Um, again, I put all my my projects in C slash slash DE2. I don't bother trying to figure out complicated paths with spaces and underscores in them because Windows is just too twisted. Um, I never use spaces in any path I generate because Unix doesn't like them very much. So, and all and the the servers around here are Unix, so I just use underscores instead. Okay. Any questions about Lab Four? Now that we're to lab four, a week into lab four. Any questions about it? About calculating Mandelbrot set? So, how many people are, uh, how many, uh, how, uh, first question is how are you going to dispatch points to iterators? Any ideas so far? You got something like a quarter of a million points, 640 by 480. You got a quarter of a million points. You have, you're, to get good performance, you're going to have to have multiple iterators, each one capable of doing complex arithmetic. And to get the best performance, they all have to finish at the same time. Because if one is still drawing, then it's not done. And so you want load balance so that all the iterators that you have built finish at about the same time. And to do that, you have to figure out some way of equitably distributing points to be calculated to different processors. So how are you going to do that?
depends on a bunch of stuff. It depends on how many iterators you're going to build. It depends on the speed of the communication channel between the iterator and the controller. It depends on how many controllers you have. Nothing? Nobody's got anything on this? I only got two weeks, folks. So your scheme is to start with a to throw one pixel at an iterator and then and then and then uh, up to a total number of iterators so you just sequentially go through when those are done then the first one that the first one that finishes gets a new pixel the next pixel in line that will work Right, and, and and presuming presuming that no cal I mean, there's a something like a quarter of a million pixels, and you have a maximum of a thousand iterations per pixel. So, and the by the way, the thousand iterations you're guaranteed to have a thousand iterations if you're inside the Mandelbrot set, so that is guaranteed to be the slowest. <coughs> Outside will be faster. So, in this case, you can guess that a thousand iterations is not very large compared to a quarter of a million points. You're probably not going to be, if you're, if you're one whole pixel slow, who cares? A very obvious optimization, by the way, which you probably have all figured out already, is to is to calculate the biggest circle that fits inside the the biggest disk actually that fits inside the Mandelbrot set you can look this up and calculate it in a radius initially and anything inside that radius you don't even bother to calculate you just set it equal to a inside and you could draw another circle here do the same thing you could draw another circle here and do the same thing each circle is smaller than the one before and so you have diminishing returns because the cost of calculating the radius is non-zero because you have to do a square and a and so on so it's going to so it's a square and a sum two squares and a sum so calculating whether trivially whether a point is inside or outside the Mandelbrot set is probably cost effective for the first circle for the biggest but for the body probably cost effective for the second one but probably not cost effective after that but maybe I'm wrong maybe you should do the cost analysis on it how many points is it gonna save you maybe there's a faster way to do it maybe instead of trying to do a greedy circle which is a very good fit do a crappy fit do a square inside that's trivial to figure out inside outside then maybe you should have a hierarchy of squares to trivially check against to find out whether you should even do the iteration or not. The the part you will be graded on is time to draw the initial Mandelbrot set. The dynamic range last year went from 0.4 seconds to 28 seconds. It is not necessary to show the progress of the drawing. You can have the screen go black, do the calculation, and fire the whole thing up to the screen at once. So you, let's say that you're putting the image in SRAM. You don't have to. You don't have to share the SRAM between the VGA monitor, between the VGA driver hardware, 
and your state machine. You can dedicate the SRAM completely to your state machine until you're done and then turn on the VGA controller and display SRAM. So it is completely acceptable if the screen goes black until you're done computing and then shows the whole image at once. I think that helps the performance somewhat. Because there is a point at which the whole system is single threaded. You ultimately have to write sequentially into the display memory. Whether the display memory is in M4K blocks or whether it's in SRAM or DRAM, you're going to have to write sequentially into it. And so you are going to have a serial bottleneck at that point. The hypothesis is that a thousand iterations is probably going to take a, around a, a maximum of a, or a minimum of a thousand cycles at whatever frequency and at whatever frequency your state machine is running at, let's say 50 megahertz, and you can do a static RAM write in two cycles. So as long as you can queue up some reads and writes and you and your average speed is never never faster than two cycles per iterator you should be fine you should never you should never have a serial bottleneck or I'm saying I'm a complicated way of saying it. I think the iterators are going to take longer to execute than writing to SRAM that's not probably certainly True in in the center of inside the Mandelbrot set, outside I not I don't have a good feel for how fast you get divergence. It could be in as little as one or two cycles, one or two calculation cycles. In which case you will have a, a bottleneck. <coughs> so. You could imagine, instead of putting out a single pixel, you could imagine sending a, a block of pixels. And the advantage of that is that you only have to send the corners. If you send every point inside, you have to send every point. It's a lot of communication. If you, say a four, if you, do, if you dispatch, say, a 4 by 4 block, then all you have to do is to send the lower right, lower left and upper right corner, for instance, and everything inside is inferred. So you might, depending on how fast your communication is relative to your computation, it may be better to send a bigger block than a smaller block. It depends on lots of things. So any other thoughts on this? It's pretty hard. Last year, the maximum number of iterators that I saw was about 13 iterators fitting on the chip. You are welcome to use the DE2115 boards. They have about four times the logic elements, but there's a startup time. If you use the DE2115, you'll, we will expect you to be able to go twice as fast. They used one NIOS with a whole bunch of I.O. ports using the I.O. ports to dis dispatch points to 13 state machine iterators.
Any other questions? All right, so the next question is then, what are you going to do for final projects? Starts in two weeks. Who's got an idea? So you would you would take in an audio stream, you would drive a, a bunch of LEDs at the output or, or or a VGA screen or something and do some sort of mapping in between. Uh huh. So it would be. No, <clears throat> do you know? Do you know that Darwin did that last year? That doesn't mean you can't do it this year. But you should add on to what they did, right? Don't start. I mean, you could start over, but you but probably get some good ideas from from what they did. Um, be interesting to try and figure out uh, some high level ways of visualizing it that are not that, that are that are compute intensive enough to make it interesting. <clears throat> I go for that. Yeah, there's plenty to do with that. What else? Anybody intrigued by more cellular automata? Game of Life, for instance, Conway's Life. I think it'd be I think it'd be a lot of fun to have a Conway's Life running at at 60 hertz on the on the monitor, uh, I think that's actually rather straightforward. What may, would make it interesting is the ability. I think I've said this before: is to import patterns in some standard format, and there are standard formats for this, believe it or not. Import patterns in some standard format off of the web into your simulator, so that you don't have to build a glider gun one one pixel at a time. And so you could you could design it so you could rotate, translate a couple of glider guns and fire gliders at each other. Gliders is a technical term for cellular automata. It means a it means a a stru cellular structure that self propagates across the screen. That'd be fun. Video stuff is plenty challenging. Anybody want to do a video project? Card recognizer. Card recognizer. Yeah, that would be that. That's that's plenty challenging. Card recognizer, face recognizer, eigen faces. Cartoonifier last year was very interesting. Real time, real time edge extraction and real time color flattening to make a cartoon like image. Without doing too much recognition. 3D extraction, stereo extraction, hard. But you could, but how about a structured light scanner? So you don't try and do you don't try and just do brute stereo with two cameras. The 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 hard thing about brute force stereo is that you have to do a cross correlation between the two images to find out which points correspond in the two images before you can then extract a depth. There's all kinds of shortcuts to do this, but it's still computationally intensive. It can surely be done. But if you use structured light, you can use a single camera with, say, a, light, a laser that generates a, light, a, a slice of light 
and then you can use the known geometry between the laser and the camera view and then the shape of the resulting line on the object to deduce the 3D shape of the object. And then doing the 3D reconstruction of the object is again pretty compute intensive. You get a cloud of points back then you have to do a triangle or uh, you have to do a least uh, squares or some side of sort of bet, best fit to the triangle cloud getting rid of overlaps and noise and all kinds of stuff. <clears throat> That'd be that'd be really interesting. What else? Music applications, real time. How about how about a high quality piano simulator? So you can use a, a variant of the wave equation solver, which is w in this case one-dimensional for strings rather than two-dimensional for drum heads. You have to do a fairly good simulation of the string because piano strings are thick enough that they do not behave completely like limp strings, but rather they have some rigidity. So there is a fourth derivative involved I believe in the in the motion and you're hitting this thing with a hammer which is a when the string bounces you get a nonlinear effect of the string bouncing off of the hammer which makes makes the simulation interesting and of course there have every every piano hammer hits I think three strings so you have to simulate three stiff strings with nonlinear driving force and uh, um, plenty complicated as a, as a simulation. A good piano simulator is a uh, interesting mathematical exercise. I have a whole book on string simulation done by a guy named Julius Smith at Stanford. Who holds the patent for the Yamaha piano simulator? Special effects generator. How about real-time, low latency, real-time guitar effects? So you play an electric guitar or an acoustic guitar into this and with less than five milliseconds latency you get special effects out. <clears throat> harmonic generation, custom distortion so you can make it sound just like a vacuum tube rather than a transistor distorter. Um, again, it could be fun. Probably annoy everybody in the lab doing that. That's what happened last semester in 4760. Or simulate an entire string quartet instead of just a piano. You got lots of I/O cycles. How about a logic analyzer? Do something. Do something more lab analytical. Build a build a 16-channel logic analyzer that could be used to debug other systems and then show that it works with a microcontroller. Any other ideas? <laughs> Nothing. Okay. So let's go back then and talk some more about floating point.
So, um, as I talked about last time, I, uh, I designed a uh, a uh, simplified floating point that's designed for doing uh, DSP. It's only nine bits of uh, <coughs> of uh, significant of mantissa, so you have to be pretty careful about about um, controlling round off error, truncation error. And generally the way you want to do this is as we talked about, I'm pretty sure earlier in the semester, is to build build filters by using second order sections. So to build a say a sixth order filter, you're going to use a second order section concatenated three times. It re followed by a gain adjustment. And so to use this DSP to test the floating point stuff, I needed a system that was that would exercise it with a broad range of inputs. And with 18-bit floating point, it's possible just barely to do exhaustive test of every bit pattern. But I figured that it would be easier and probably more instructive for me to build a filter, uh, a high order filter, and then show that it worked properly without glitches. If it works properly without glitches, then almost assuredly the arithmetic is correct. So the minimum that has to be <clears throat> that has to be generated to make a system like this work is this unit. You have to be able to write a second order section followed by a gain and then concatenate those together. You can set some of the gains to one obviously. Or you can leave out the gain on some of these, but you have to have at least this capability. And I wanted to do it at audio rate, so the clear choice was to build a state machine that used one floating point adder or, or used uh, minimize the floating point operations let me put it this way by serializing it by making a uh, by making a state machine that would use a floating point accumulator to 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 generate a filter function so The, the basic the basic unit is going to be a infinite impulse response second order section I2 for second order infinite impulse and it requires as you'll remember three B coefficients two A coefficients and the gain assuming that the filter is always normalized to uh, for A1 equals 1 and in the case of a floating point filter, we can easily do that. There's no reason to scale the filter ever because we have a large dynamic range. So fractions, representing fractions are not a problem. And so in some ways, the filter design is easier. We have B1 to 3, and we have A2 and 3, and we have a gain input. They ended up writing a MATLAB program that converted MATLAB floats to uh, short floats to the 18-bit floats because otherwise it was so damn annoying to do it by hand. Because there's all kinds of bit twiddling that has to go on. Then. The style I like for generating state machines is to do all of the calculations as combinatorial logic and do nothing in the clocked statements except update registers. Copy the new value 
to a register. I, I, I like that. I think it's cleaner. I like to keep the arithmetic separate from the register updates. We can argue about that style all day. But that's the way I like to run it. Um, I'm not going to bother to declare stuff because it's all 18-bit unsigned. But um, we need to be able to do an int to floating point. There's an int to floating point uh, module f input. that produces as output a floating point number and takes as input audio in and the int to float converter that I wrote only does 10 bits of int because after all with a 9-bit mantissa 10 bits is certainly enough. So we're specifying <clears throat> 10 bits of, of analog input and a zero here which is a scale factor in case you want to mess with the scale of the of the integer that you're inputting. Then we need a floating point to int output audio out int and with an input of audio out floating point and again a scale factor of zero And then the final output, audio out, this is the actual output, then is given by audio out int, which is in two's complement concatenated with 6 hex 0. So doing this concatenation takes the the 10 bit uh, int and converts it to a 18 bit number. Looks like a 60. Oh, so, I'm sorry, 16 bit number. Yeah, of course, because the audio is 16 bits. 16 bits 2's complement. Then we have to define a MAC operation and so we're going to use the, the FP MALT module which takes two floats, returns a float, combinatorial. We're going to call this floating C times V constant times variable and multiply some F coefficient or I should say produce some some F coefficient times value and make that the product of f of f coefficient and floating value where coefficient and value are going to be registers that we load specific b's and a's into and specific partial products into or partial sums into to do the next uh, multiply then we're going to have an FP add, which is going to be the floating MAC, the multiply accumulate. 
So we're going to have some f mac nu being the sum of f mac old, that's the accumulate part, added to f coefficient times value. <clears throat> so all of the arithmetic is done here. And then the state machine just goes through and cycles through all of the states to add up five different products of input and output and the appropriate coefficients. So we're going to do a, the usual always at pause edge of some clock, our state clock. If we're in reset mode, then state goes to the wait state, which I just, which I just, which I specified here is state 15. Because we want to wait, we want to do exactly one calculation on every audio left right clock and state 15 is the synchronization state that waits for the next clock to come through. Otherwise, we we go brutally through all of the other states. So state 1 is going to be We set the old value of the MAC to 0, which in this case we should write as 18 binary 0. That initializes the multiply and accumulate for this time step. Sets the F coefficient to B1, sets the F value to audio in floating point, starts saving some state, input state and then sets the state to four tick decimal two. Once you have specified these two registers to be set to B1 and audio in floating point, then combinatorially combinatorially the product and the and the mac value are formed outside of the clock statement they're formed as soon as they can so to speak as soon as the logic settles so that by the time we get to state 2 we better put an end in here by the time we get to state 2 we can set f mac old to f mac new because the addition has already been done. We set f coefficient, so EFF to B2. We set f 
value to x1 n minus 1 and we set state to 3 sorry 4 tick decimal 3 and then end that's all we have to do then until we get done with the entire sum so we're going to do another state where the coefficient is set to be 3 and this is set to x1 n minus 2 then we do exactly the same thing again but with the coefficient set to a2 and y n1 and just step through exactly the same set of states because all the real work is being done combinatorially so after we get done with a state 3 where we're going to handle B3 and a state 4 where we handle the A2 state and a state 5 where we handle A3 then we're going to get to some state 6 where we actually have to do something different because at this point now we have done the full multiply and accumulate to form <coughs> to, to do the direct form type 2 summation so we say then that f1 y n minus 1 is going to take on the value of f mac nu this is state 6 f value gets f mac nu f coefficient gets gain the gain input and at that point then all we have to do is update the history so that f1 y n2 gets f1 y n1 and remember these happen simultaneously so the correct thing happens here these are all simultaneous non-blocking assignments x1 n1 gets x x1 n2 gets x1 n x1 n2 gets x1 n1 and at that point we're done doing the calculation for the filter so factoring out the the calculations is as a as a pair of uh, modules makes the state machine very regular and easy to to write it's just a matter of assigning coefficients and assigning values to the floating point uh, inputs and then reading the new mac value back out again so that's why i like to factor stuff this way and the system was plenty fast so that a, a sixth order filter finished in something like 20 states uh, which means you could reuse the floating point accumulators and MAC units for probably 10 different filters in one audio time step so you could concatenate different filters into the same module and just do several several copies at different frequencies 
9 bits was amazingly enough, enough accuracy so that even a sixth order filter ran with reasonable accuracy. And the reason that's surprising is as you go to higher and higher order, the way you get sharper corners on the frequency response is you get cancellation of very small terms near the corners. And I was surprised that 9 bits was enough to catch that cancellation, but the reason it works is that I was using second order sections. If you just build a sixth order filter without using second order sections, it totally fails. So, if you're going to do any DSP for for your in in your final project, you could you could use floating point filters, floating point state machine filters, or floating point or fixed point state machine filters. But you could expect easily, if you want to go to the trouble to do a hundred poles of filtering or maybe three hundred poles of filtering in one audio time step. So you could write three hundred. You could write 150 two-pole filters that would run in one audio time step using one multiplier. And so you could just do a brute force. Why, why bother with, a, with an FFT? Just use continuous time filters. Just build, just build a whole pile of overlapping filters have, that have, that have So this is this is F and this is amplitude. Build filters that look like this, whose that have about 50% overlap, and then treat each one of these as a spectral estimate. That has the big advantage over FFT that you don't have to segment the input waveform into a block before you transform it, because it is continuous time. You get an output for every input sample. Had one group one year build a spectrum analyzer that did this. So they built a, they only used 40 filters. So they had 40 frequency slots, up to 40 here. And they had continuous time. So what you saw was a plot of red in one box here. If the energy at that frequency at that time was high, you saw red. If the energy at that time at that frequency was low, you saw green. And a color spectrum in between. And this thing all scrolled to the left so that you saw the new boxes came on at this edge and scrolled off to the left so that you had a continuous time um, power spectrogram. It was pretty cool. It's fun to watch music go through it. It was, uh, but it needed more resolution. It needed more vertical resolution. Remember, instead of just 40 frequencies, it needed a few hundred frequencies, which you could do.